Namaste. Well, we've been talking in these videos on Katopanishad about the background, the context for meditation and self-realization. And this is very important. But we also want to talk about the practice. How do you realize what's being talked about in the text? So, you know, our good old chart of the four states of consciousness and how we begin from a dualistic point of view, Jagrat consciousness, to conditioned non-duality, which is a view that God and the universe and everything are transformations of Brahman. And then once we actually understand what Brahman is, that is completely non-dual and the only reality and so forth, as given in the Upanishads, that starts the next stage where we're in meditation, Vivartavada. So in Vivartavada, we view the world as illusory and the self alone as reality. And then the challenge comes to realize that vision. That is the purpose of meditation. So that's what we're talking about here. How do you meditate? How do you realize the vision that the world is illusion? Huh? Jagan mitya. Brahma satyam jagan mitya. <laughs> That the world is illusion, Brahman is the only reality. Well, it has to be through meditation. And so, in the Tika to uh, 211, Katopanishad 211, which we went over the other day, there's a reference to the Mundaka Upanishad 322. Amanya kamayate manyamana Sakama bhirjayate tatra tatra Haryapta kamasya kritatmanastu Ehaiva sarve praviliyanti kama He who covets the desirable things while brooding on their virtues is born amidst those very surroundings along with the desires. But for one whose wishes are fulfilled and whose self is self-established, all the longings vanish, even here. This is like a capsule description of the whole process of sadhana, which culminates in the practice of meditation leading to realization of Brahman. So how does that look? Uh, I mean, how does the actual experience look? Well, first of all, let me describe the principle. What he says here is that if you covet, if you uh, think that the desirable qualities of objects are something worthwhile, then you are born among those objects and the desires for them. That means you get a body that's already set up with all these desires. And isn't this like everybody's experience? That we are born into this world full of all kinds of objects and we have all kinds of desires for them. So we calculate or um, conceive of our identity in terms of those objects and desires, which, of course, are, are not self. In fact, they're impermanent, unsatisfactory, and not self, as the Buddha said. So, this is what causes the suffering in the world. The fact that we are running after these things in the outside world, our attention is going out. We're extroverted. And because those things are fundamentally unsatisfactory, it causes suffering. And unfortunately, the common wisdom is that, well, 
if uh, we don't have enough satisfaction from the things we've got, then we have to get more, right? <laughs> no, that just causes more suffering. And we see people who have a lot of property or power or money or are very beautiful, talented, famous, and so on, have all kinds of severe problems that <laughs> those who are not so much invested in material existence don't have. So, in other words, we don't want to be one of those beautiful, rich, powerful, famous people because it's more suffering and it's more attachment to the externals. We want to go the other way. What does the second line say? But for one whose wishes are fulfilled and whose self is self-established, all the longings vanish even here, even in material life. We can uh, let go of these desires and go inside, establish our existence, establish our being in the self, in Brahman, then these desires for all these external things just kind of go away. How do we do that? Well, that's what I'm getting to. So when I meditate, I'll sit down in a comfortable position, which for me, because I've spent years developing my seat, uh, is usually uh, the easy posture with the legs crossed or siddhasana with the legs crossed, or I lay down. Uh, I do that a lot nowadays. I'll, I'll lie down in bed and uh, go inside. In other words, I take my attention from the outside and I turn it around and go inside. One of the things that I use to help me focus on this is that when I close the outside eyelids, huh, it's like the eyelids on the inside open. <laughs> I can see something that I can't see when the eyes are open to the outside. And what is that? The inner light, the light of Brahman. I'm not sure what it is exactly. One theory I have is that the light of the self, myself, because I am the self, Aham Brahmasmi, so the light of myself is being reflected in the purified mind, the mind which is purified of all desires. And another theory I have is that it's uh, Nirguna Brahman observing Saguna Brahman. And I'll talk about some of the evidence for both these theories in a little bit. So what is the experience of a person who goes inside and lets go of the body, the sense impressions from the various senses, and even the thoughts in the mind. Well, you find yourself facing a tremendous light, like brighter than the sun and that, that fills the entire visual field. Um, and the, the properties of this light, the qualities of this light, are that it is the self. You feel like it's yourself. It's tremendously familiar and strange at the same time. <laughs> it's... Uh, very friendly. You get this really friendly vibe coming from it uh, because it's you. It's just like you because it's you. You have this feeling of coming home, of being welcome. Uh, and I should add that this light has a special quality. It's not like the light that we see externally. It has a kind of sparkly, uh, amorphous, quality to it. In other words, it seems to be made up of millions of tiny lights. And those lights move around and make different forms and stuff like this. But this may only be because of the interference by the mind. 
Now, one thing you'll notice is that when you have thoughts during meditation or concentration, they block the light that's coming in the inner vision. So if you go into meditation and you can successfully let go of the body and the senses, but you're still seeing the light as blocked, maybe these kind of amorphous like clouds, like dark clouds getting in the way of the light, that means you're still attached to thoughts. So you have to work more on purifying the mind. Now, a lot of people are going to say, what light? <laughs> and it, it's true. I remember when I first started meditating, seems like eons ago, but it was probably about 60 years ago. All I saw inside was darkness, complete black, nothing, zero. Yeah, I could imagine things in the mind, you know, picture things in the mind. But as far as actual spiritual light, nada. So what happened was, um, when I've, well, first of all, I got an initiation from Takar Singh. Takar Singh was uh, one of the sons of Kirpal Singh. And uh, he gave me an initiation that opened up my inner eye and I could see that light for the first time. And that was when I was like 22, 23 years old. And then uh, later on, of course, uh, when I got into serious sitting meditation, I mean 10, 12, 14, 16 hours a day, okay, that light became very prominent. But there was also darkness. There was also a deep, dense darkness, which is sushupti. So the average person, I think, starting this meditation is going to find themselves in the mind. And there's going to be all kinds of thoughts competing for your attention. And maybe you get some visions of thoughts you know, like thought pictures. But all of this is irrelevant, and it's not the self. So don't confuse it with the self. Uh, if you're having trouble stabilizing the mind, the use of a mantra is very effective. Whatever mantra you have faith in. And if that doesn't work at all, that means you're not ready for meditation you should go back and practice bhakti until the mind is purified. Very important point. A lot of people start meditation and they don't really get anywhere, but they think they have to meditate. And so they force themselves to continue, even though it's a grind and they're not getting anything. Uh, and after a while, they just give up. That's a shame. Uh, it shouldn't happen like that. Uh, what really is going on is that the mind is too much polluted by material desire. And they have to go back and do bhakti or even karma yoga until the mind is purified. Now, if you go back in time on this channel, you'll see I have covered pretty deeply um, the most popular forms of bhakti, especially Bhakti to Shiva and Shakti. And I actually practiced these at the time when I was making the series. And they really work, you know. They really give a profound effect of cleansing the mind. So if you're having trouble in meditation, if it seems you're not making any progress, this is highly recommended as a way to cleanse the mind but then when the mind is clear, when you sit down and close the eyes and turn the attention around and go in, you should see this light. And this light is the best indicator of how successfully you are engaged in meditation. And like uh, that verse that we started off read, for one whose wishes are fulfilled, 
and whose self is self-established, all the longings vanish. You don't anymore get caught up in desires and material activity because you realize that this is not me. This is not who I am. This is not myself. This is not what I am. This is something external, something extraneous. It's just an upadi covering the real self, which is Brahman alone. And this is what I have to focus my attention on. And when you do, you find ever increasing joy and bliss spontaneously arising from within. And really, that's all you want to do is sit there and relish it. And that's it, folks. That's the highest. That is the goal. That's the object of sadhana and self-realization. Plunging into the ocean of Brahman and just, just splashing around and swimming and diving and having fun because it's pure pleasure. It's pure wonder. It's pure enjoyment. Aung Tat Sat. Aung Shakti Aung. Aung Namas Shivaya.